It's a short-lived series of weekly adventures of running around while being chased by an obsessive villain. I mean, that doesn't exactly narrow it down, does it? What kind of planet is this? But what if, and I'm just guessing here, what if it was a TV series set on the planet of the apes? There were such humans, Galen. And they called themselves... Ass... Astronauts. Astronauts. Planet of the Apes was first a book, then a 1960 ape movie, which spawned four sequels with progressively longer titles. Plans for a small screen adaptation had been on the cards for a while, but as the theatrical features were still doing well, no one was really in that much of a hurry to mess with success. We must be patient and wait battle for the planet of the apes in 1973 proved to be the end of the road for the apes on the big screen apes film producer arthur p jacobs had wanted to move on from apes who were good for business but after five movies everyone was sick of craft services only serving bananas jacobs sold the franchise to 20th century fox with the studio looking at its options on how and more importantly where to continue the apes franchise Realistically, at the time, the options were either a movie or a television series. Fox did not buy the Apes franchise just to make it a Viewmaster exclusive. You can tell me the truth. The first three Planet of the Apes movies were broadcast by CBS and rated really well. So well, in fact, that a TV version of the Planet of the Apes was greenlit over other science fiction pilots in the works, including Gene Roddenberry's Genesis 2. Apes was considered such a strong bet that they didn't even bother with the usual process of making a single pilot episode and just ordered a series. You know, I've, I've heard stories like that, but I always thought there were stories. I never believed that it really happened. That's akin to buying a new car without taking it for a test drive first. Getting it home, finding you can't drive stick shift or see over the dashboard and why are they all honking? <laughs> Astronauts from the year 1980, Alan Verdon and Peter Burke crash land on a planet that turns out to be Earth in the year 3085. Yeah, well, we could have landed in a worse place, I'll tell you that. <laughs> They find themselves on a planet run by, as its television, darn dirty apes with a subjugated human population, who, truth be told, are also darn dirty. Yeah, you know, you go to school, you work hard, you wind up fishing for raw material for a fertilizer factory. Chimpanzee Galen befriends the two astronauts and joins them on their quest to find a way home. A computer disc may help them only if they can find a working computer. I mean, ordering one up on eBay isn't possible, and the simian version Ape Bay doesn't allow humans to sign up. Maybe the world would be better if no creature controlled another, if all worked together as equals. Meanwhile, ape counsellor Zaius knows about the human-dominated past on the planet and wants Galen, Burke and Verdon silenced. Very few know your history, and very few will ever know. His attack dog, Urko, is an enthusiastic hunter of the trio. Obsessed doesn't even come remotely close to adequately describing Urko. Why must we go to all this trouble? Just let my surgeons perform the usual brain operation on the humans. He will tell us whatever we want and answer all our questions. Alan Verdon is the group leader, desperate to find a way back to his own home and his family. Ron Harper plays him as a serious man, someone not prone to smiling or joking, and occasionally comes across like a high school science teacher. We should be able to find some copper plumbing pipe. Then all we need is a container and sulfuric acid to rig up a battery and get this thing going again. Teaching humans and apes about curing malaria. It's quinine. It's extracted from the bark of a tree, a tree called a cinchona. Gas masks, computers, animal husbandry, etc. The furrows hold the water. It won't run off with your rich topsoil. Verdon is usually the quickest of the trio to want to get involved in local problems. Solar from the sun. We took energy from the sun's light, stored it in batteries, which provided electricity. Burke is the slightly more flippant of the two humans. Where I come from, mothers used to warn their daughters about me. But uh, you've really raised caution to new heights. <laughs> or a metaphor that sails over the head of the locals like a seagull racing for the dumpster behind the fish restaurant. You stick with me. You've got a lot to learn about the value of creative cowardice. James Norton gets an occasional one-liner as a way to distinguish the character from Verdon other than just having different hair colour. You don't exactly have to put it that way. Their chimpanzee companion, Galen, is curious about these intelligent humans, trading his cushy ape lifestyle with that of being a hunted fugitive. Ooh, cool. Boiled tree sap. And cornflour. 
Hmm. That's the best we could do. It's called glue. The series producers weren't even considering approaching a star of McDowell's calibre, but when the actor's representatives approached the producers about him starring in the series, well, it seemed like a good idea. Galen, hold that a second, will you? I can't. Why not? My fingers are stuck together. McDowell plays him as more of a curious hobbit going on an adventure, less of a scientist looking for answers, and more someone going on a road trip with friends. Even if that road trip involves them running for their lives in mortal terror hunted by a deranged gorilla. And the stalker is an actual gorilla, Urko. If this happens again, I won't just kill the blacksmiths, I'll kill you too. Urko is one of the least reasonable villains in any similar series. When you capture a rebel, it's probably better to kill his whole family. Those around him are usually infected. His job is to hunt down the humans, and he loves his job, taking it to extremes. He's not remotely interested in learning or furthering the cause of scientific advancement. You have words! I have weapons! Only hunting down the humans. He is quite vicious, ready to kill humans at the drop of a hat, and also not above cheating at horse racing. Occasionally, the humans briefly join forces with Urko, but as usual, all bets are off at the end of each episode. Kill them! Next time, humans, next time. Urko was played by Mark Leonard, well known to Star Trek fans as appearing as a Romulan, a Klingon, and a Vulcan, where he played Spock's father, Sarek. Are you planning to beat the prisoner again? If necessary. You'll kill him, if necessary. Booth Coleman plays a scaled down version of Zaius. He's not necessarily the same Zaius as in the films. He's determined, but not quite as ruthless. Movie Zaius didn't need Urko to do his dirty work. I suppose it depends on who you find worse, the debt collector repossessing your boat, or the one who, as a result of a typo on the paperwork, is trying to repossess your two-door sports cat. The ape leadership want to get the trio out of circulation before they spread wild ideas of humans and apes living together on better terms, since that's clearly crazy talk. I could have you imprisoned for that. You haven't answered my question. I never heard the question! Planet of the Apes on television would come to resemble so many sci-fi and adventure series from the 60s to the 80s one person or a group searching for something while on the run from an authority figure, with the person or group putting themselves in harm's way in order to help people they meet along the way. Not again. Yes, The Fugitive, The Hulk, Invisible Man, Logan's Run, The A-Team. It is a formula that lets writers use the same premises over and over. You're a bigger fool than I thought. The continuity of the apes is not exactly the same as that in the films, which of course had continuity with all the consistency of lumpy porridge with extra lumps. The extremely subservient humans here can speak, but they don't always have a lot to say. Bring them forward. Larko. Polo. The apes aren't quite as vicious as those in the first two films, and they can occasionally be reasoned with, to an extent, apart from Urko, who's just totally belligerent and unwilling to compromise on anything. How could a human idea serve us? If you went to see a movie with Urko and there was a choice of viewing, say you wanted to see Every Which Way But Loose, or you could just see Urko's favourite film, dollars to bananas, you'd be seeing Bring Me the Head of Ape Garcia again for the 13th time. Who is this fool's ass? Each episode brings things down to street level. Verdon and Burke aren't interested in sticking around, even though the chances of them finding a way home are slimmer than a book listing retired ice hockey players who still have all of their own teeth. Out of 14 episodes, only a few dealt directly with Verdon and Burke's search for a way home. Most of the time they encounter a group of humans who are having difficulties with the local ape authorities. Depending on the episode, the humans are an oppressed mass or just downright slaves, with Verdon in particular quite keen to stir up the locals into standing up to the apes. Thank you, Cestus, but we gotta be moving on. Other episodes see Verdon and Burke introduce, or more accurately, reintroduce, scientific concepts or methods that have been long lost to the apes and humans of the 31st century. Maybe that's why so many people have their noses out of joint when these two know-alls show up pointing out everything you're doing wrong. Look, I know the plumbing tutorial videos say to turn off the mains water supply before installing new taps, but who's got time for that? Also, does anybody have a towel? Much like his involvement in the development of the first film, Rod Serling worked on some early episodes, though his work was later rewritten. Early story threads about the astronauts looking for a working computer in order to find a way home are soon forgotten, as is Galen being wanted for murder. 
in an era where practically every show had to be made as a standalone story that could be viewed in almost any order, there's no scope for much character development or an overall plot progressing. I don't care. The show manages to explore parts of the various ape and human civilizations, but in such a way that very little of it affects other episodes. There's no reason at all for that. Huh. Location work for the series was filmed at the Fox Ranch, which was at various times also used for exteriors on three of the Apes movies, as well as shows like MASH, Logan's Run, Arc 2 and Tour of Duty. Lalo Schifrin provided a theme that fits in well with Jerry Goldsmith's score for the original film. The opening title sequence is probably the best part of the series, with some really striking visuals. The series itself is decently made. What is important, I think is that killing should stop. Though the humans often sound rather stilted since they obviously can't speak with contemporary speech patterns. Man. I knew it now I'll be given to the sea gods like Gato. Certain elements to the story seem very, very, very familiar. In a few episodes, one of the trio is injured or one of the trio is captured and has to be rescued. Go at once! Burke and Verdon have to pretend to be placid slaves while Galen pretends to be anyone else other than the wanted murderer Galen. You'd thought we'd forgotten, didn't you, Galen? I never knew there was so much ham in an ape. <laughs> they also don't seem to get all that far in their journey, not straying far enough away from the ape city to preclude a quick visit. Central City is 19 hours away. Can you run all that distance? Or to stop off at Galen's parents for a spell. We didn't come to the city to visit. I'm sorry, but we came to get Burke. There are a few better than average episodes. A few episodes were set in the ruins of destroyed cities. One of those had Burke trapped in an underground station with Urko, and the two have to work together, or try to work together. We'll go to work. The final episode saw the trio encounter a human who's on the cusp of creating a working hang glider. Yes, it is the 1970s. I'm just a female scientist with none of your wisdom in dealing with humans. A chimpanzee scientist takes an unusual interest in the project, flirts shamelessly with Galen, before she reveals her plan is to use the power of flight to bomb the ape leadership and take over for herself. Unfortunately, these few interesting storylines do get lost in the shuffle. We burn this, collect the fumes, we've got sulfur dioxide. You blend it at the right temperature with water and oxygen, you make sulfuric acid. Hmm. Then we melt down the copper we found, form a base conductor, and we've got a battery. Verdon befriends a young boy who turns out to be Rorschach. A human woman falls for Verdon. A blind chimpanzee female falls for Burke, thinking he's an ape. And Galen, when he does get lucky, it's with a wannabe mass murderer and potential dictator. Sounds like the famed rejected early draft of Love Actually 2, Force 10 from Love Actually. The Planet of the Apes series premiered in September 1974, but was cancelled after 14 episodes, due to the network's ratings expectations not being met. Having to put so many actors in elaborate ape prosthetics for each episode was not cheap. Neither was the fact you couldn't use stock sets or backlot streets. Science fiction series in the 1970s often ended up suffering the same problem. If the series could use the same sets, costumes and locations as the contemporary detective show, the show had a chance but every series that tried to build a world from scratch would run into the same issue. No matter how good the ratings were, it would just cost too much. No, I can't explain that. Apes was more successful in some overseas markets, but that was not enough to avoid a cancellation. The story of Galen, Verdon and Burke ended there and then, though that's not quite the end of the tale. Yes, I know apes don't have tales, but I digress. But you might as well say yes, they are very stubborn. Around 1980, some episodes were edited together to create Planet of the Apes telemovies for syndication, with five made in total. McDowell was brought back in full Galen makeup at one point to record tops and tails for some versions of these TV movies, and in one of them basically told us that Verdon and Burke had managed to find a way home, rescued by, oh, I don't know, let's just say Mo. <laughs> you can't be serious! He's got the fever in... <laughs> Poor Ron Harper, he manages to get home and then ends up swapping places with his brother when he appeared in the last season of Land of the Lost. The merchandising for the show was surprisingly strong, even in a time before Star Wars rewrote the business model for TV and movie tie-ins. Mego in particular made quite an impact in the toy market with their line of Planet of the Apes action figures. My job is protection, not the gathering of useless information. 
No information is useless. Planet of the Apes, the live action series, was all right. It's not amazing or outstanding, but neither is it downright awful. It's a show that had potential in its core concept, but wasn't executed well enough to pull it off. It also doesn't try to be its own thing, very rarely aspiring to be anything more than a fairly shallow, small screen translation of a movie series that at the time was considered more than a little past its primate. I mean, prime. And when are you going to give up that pipe dream? When I see my family. Planet of the Apes films would often pick either a human or an ape as a protagonist, with either having allies of the other species. Planet of the Apes on television put its human and ape protagonists on equal footing. Harper and Norton would get most of the screen time and both do a solid job. But McDowell often steals every scene he's in. There would be a cartoon series broadcast the following year and two different reboots decades later. Planet of the Apes characters Galen and Urko, along with Zaius, Caesar, Zira and Cornelius, would join the pantheon of great primate characters, along with King Kong, Monkey, Bear, Lancelot, Link, Secret Chimp, Donkey Kong, Magilla Gorilla and of course the goat, Grape Ape. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below or check out some of our other videos. I fear you, all of you, listening to a fool.